final uh, talk about this quantum Fourier transform beyond Schwarz, al Schwarz algorithm. And uh, today I will talk about uh, operator Fourier transform and metropolis and Gibbs sampling. <coughs> uh, so this operator Fourier transform is a uh, if if we don't come from this uh, metropolis algorithm perspective, then it may be uh, a bit foreign. So here I switch the order. First, I will tell you why and how we want to apply it, and then and explain you how it works actually, because <coughs> without motivation, it may be a bit uh, difficult to understand why we care about such an operation. But uh, maybe in advance, I can just say that operator Fourier transform is a uh, is sort of a uh, operator analog of, of phase estimation. Uh, in quantum mechanics, there are two views uh, on, on how you evolve uh, the time. One view is called the Schrodinger picture, when you track how the quantum states change. And then uh, phase estimation is sort of uh, in that framework. And there is another one called the Heisenberg picture, when you stay when you keep your quantum states fixed, but your operators are evolving with time. And now operator Fourier transform is kind of the Heisenberg evolution ana analog of quantum phase estimation. Okay, and hopefully it will be become clear why I'm saying this. <laughs> okay, so the motivation is uh, is metropolis sampling and preparing Gibbs states. So uh, the Gibbs distribution of a classical system uh, is, is a very important object in uh, statistical physics, and uh, it describes the distribution of states at some temperature, and uh, the standard notation is that temperature is 1 over beta, and this beta parameter is, uh, this inverse temperature is used in defining it. And uh, so this distribution is that if you are given some energy function, uh, on your state space, uh, then the Gibbs distribution is going to be proportional to this exponential e to the minus beta e i. So the i state will be uh, will have probability which is proportional to this exponential thing, and uh, as you can see, if the energy is uh, is small, then this exponential is large. So nature prefers states which have low energy. And as you increase the energy, the exponential becomes very, very small. And so it's very unlikely that you find your state in a high energy state. This is the intuitive meaning of it. Uh, and then the quantum analog of this is that uh, uh, your state is basically diagonal in the, in the basis of your Hamiltonian. So it is a distribution over energy eigenstates of your Hamiltonian. And formally, you can write it as e to the minus beta the Hamiltonian. <coughs> and if you would uh, diagonalize your Hamiltonian, then it would be the same thing as before. Just now, this is an ensemble over the uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and weighted by the energies, as described by the Hamiltonian of your system. OK, so this is a Gibbs state. And uh, so in this talk, I will have much more uh, physics connections. So if, if I say something that maybe is unclear, then please interrupt and ask. OK, and so first I would like to start by reviewing this uh, classical uh, discrete Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. And the objective in general is that you want to sample from some target distribution, which is proportional to some, some vector that you are given. In our case, it will be just this Gibbs distribution. So it doesn't have to be normalized, but it has to be non-negative, and you want to find a, a distribution proportional to it. And so an example would be uh, you have a n spin Ising model, so you have basically just bit strings uh, of length n, uh, and then you your energy function is defined by this classical Hamiltonian, Everything is diagonal in the computational basis. That's why it's classical. And then you have some two-body terms and some, and some single-body terms. And uh, according to this formula, you can compute the energy of any configuration. Uh, and then your goal is, 
So this zi, zij are just the height and jth coordinate of, of your of your b string z. And uh, and now this target distribution would be the just just the Giz distribution defined by this energy function. And so the dimension of this space or, or the or the size of the configuration space would be uh, two to the lowercase n because you had n spins. Okay, so this is just some background. And uh, this metropolis algorithm actually works more generally. It doesn't have to be the Gibbs distribution, but any, any tau suffices. And here is the algorithm. So it starts with some symmetric uh, exploratory Markov chain. They call it exploratory because it just, it, it, it's a good idea to start with a Markov chain which kind of rapidly converges and, 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 like and uh, checks lots of parts of this configuration space to begin with. Uh, and so a very good example would be in this classical case that you just pick a random uh, spin of these n spins and you flip the value from plus to minus one or back. Uh, and so you start with this very easy process. For example, if you just do this random uh, bit flip, then because it's a symmetric process, its stationary distribution will be a uniform distribution. And this is not what we want, but we can modify this uh, this um, random walk on this configuration space such that now it will converge to the Gibbs state. And this is what the Metropolis Hastings algorithm does. Uh, it says that, okay, we will modify the original Markov chain. Let's first try and make a transition from Z to Z prime according to this Markov chain with the probabilities described there. And if my uh, probability, if, if my likelihood uh, actually went up, then you accept it. So uh, tau, tau z prime being larger than tau z, it means that that's a more likely state. Uh, in, in, in physics language, that would correspond in a state to a lower energy state. So if your likelihood in the target distribution is, is higher, then it's a good move, then you accept it. However, uh, if the likelihood of this new uh, state would be smaller than where you were, then you uh, then you only accept this, this move with this uh, ratio of the likelihoods and otherwise you reject it with probability one minus tau z prime over tau z. So in particular, if, if, if z prime is much more unlikely than z, then this, this number will be very close to zero and you almost always reject. And the good thing about this algorithm is that this modified Markov chain, which uh, applies this metropolis Hastings rule, has some very nice properties. Uh, first of all, the stationary distribution of this Markov chain will be the target distribution, and we all achieve this all without knowing the actual normalization of this vector, which is good. Uh, and this being the stationary distribution, it means that, uh, well, hopefully it will converge to this as you apply your Markov chain for some time. And for analyzing these kind of properties, it's uh, very useful to know that, that this Markov chain is reversible with respect to this target distribution, which is also called the detailed advanced property, uh, which I wouldn't write here, but there will be some exercise about this in exercise class if you haven't seen this concept. And moreover, uh, in some sense, this uh, metropolis version of your, of your, of your walk is in some sense, the closest Markov chain to the original one, which has now the target distribution uh, as the stationary state. And uh, well, it's also nice in practice because it turns out that often this process just converges rapidly to this stationary state, and then you can sample from your target distribution by running this Markov chain, this modified algorithm, only uh, for a short time. Okay, now uh, you can also define a continuous version of, is of this metropolis Hastings algorithm, which is less well known, but, but that will be more useful in the quantum case. So I wanted to review this classical continuous time version. Uh, so now you have a continuous time Markov chain with a symmetric generator L. This generator uh, is such that it's off diagonal entries are non-negative numbers that describe jump rates. So something like if I do, uh, if, if 
during a small uh, time period, how likely is that I, I do a jump uh, from my current state to the next one. Uh, it's a little, little bit similar to, I don't know how, like radiative decay. It, it would be like, if, if, it's, uh, if you are modeling your uh, radiative de decay, then you would have the, uh, I guess, the, the state when, when the molecule is still, or the atom is still uh, intact, and then the decayed one, and then it, you just know that it has some decay, and it continuously decays with its probability, and you just need to exponentiate these jump rates to get to know how, like how many of your original atoms remain. Uh, and so to make sure that uh, this process, when you, when you take this generator and exponentiate it, it, it preserves the probabilities. So then you need to make sure that once you jumped from somewhere, then the probability of staying there is reduced. So the jump rates, uh, you need to uh, sum up all the jump rates for a particular state and, uh, and take it with a minus sign in the diagonal entry because that's how much you decay in the original position. And so this defines that way a Laplacian matrix, which corresponds to actually a weighted directed graph. And it's very natural because <coughs> you often draw pictures about Markov chains as walks on a graph, and indeed they are mathematically essentially equivalent, especially in this reversible case. Okay, so now the continuous time metropolis Hastings is very similar to the, co uh, to the discrete one. Uh, we just need to modify the jump rates as opposed to the stochastic matrix, which des describes the discrete jumps. And uh, if a jump <coughs> happens to increase the likelihood in the target distribution, then you always accept the jump. So <coughs> for the modified uh, Laplacian, you take the same entry at that position. However, if this uh, infinitesimal jump it decreases, the likelihood then once again you reduce this jump to this. Uh, uh, you only accept this jump with this ratio of the two uh, probabilities, which is going to be less than one in this case. And otherwise, this reject the move, which means that you are basically <coughs> decreasing the diagonal entry uh, in your Laplacian. And once again, if you are uh, doing this metropolis version of your continuous time Markov chain, then you get si similar properties uh, than in the discrete case. Once again, the stationary distribution, when you exponentiate this process, this continuous process will have the stationary distribution, the target distribution. And once again, we don't need to know normalization of this distribution <coughs> or this vector. Um, and once again, you will get a reversible process, which is detailed balanced. And, uh, and once again, it's somehow, in some sense, the closest generator to the original one. And likely, uh, similarly, uh, converges often very uh, fast in physically motivated examples. OK, so there is very tight connection between the discrete and the continuous, but uh, it will be somehow more friendly to the quantum case, I, as I will tell you in the next slide. Uh, so let's try to do uh, quantum metropolis sampling. And in this case, the objective function, the Hamiltonian, will be non-commuting. Uh, and that causes a lot of troubles, a lot of trouble. And uh, yeah, so for example, the example that I showed you was some classical spin system. And if you just uh, uh, replace the single uh, site terms, from a Z operator, you if, if I would write this with a Z operator here, then it would be exactly the same as classical, nothing changes. But if I replace this by an X operator, then suddenly my Hamiltonian will have non-commuting terms, and everything will become potentially much more difficult. And OK, so now the goal would be to prepare the quantum Gibbs state on a quantum computer. And now let's try uh, and describe an analogous version to the discrete time Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So uh, once again, you start with some symmetric exploratory quantum process, which is a quantum channel. And once again, you can just do the same as before. You pick a random spin and flip it. You apply this xj operator random uh, location. 
And so the quantum metropolis will similarly modify uh, this, this quantum channel. And this was a nature paper by Tama et al. a bit more than 10 years ago. So once again, uh, you can just uh, look at the energies of your, of your states. If after the move, your energy decreased, then you get to a more likely state in the Gibbs distribution, and therefore you accept it. And so here I just uh, explicitly use this uh, uh, diagonalization of my Hamiltonian according to these energy levels. And if my uh, new energy after the jump actually went up, then similarly I apply the same, we can apply the same metropolis rule as before and only accept this move with this probability and otherwise reject. And so uh, this is, as I described, is basically just a random walk on the eigenstates. So it's basically the same thing as in the classical situation, just you are doing this walk and understanding it in different basis. <coughs> uh, however, uh, yeah, okay, so and, and, and because of, of this uh, view that it's actually just a random walk on the eigenstates, uh, the, the same proof will work, showing that this actually converges to the Gibbs distribution. Uh, and hopefully it will converge rapidly for physically motivated examples. <coughs> but now comes the difficult part. Because it's a non-commuting system, it can be quite challenging to actually compute the energy. So how do you decide that the state where you're currently in, what's the energy of that state? Well, the best guess the best guess that you can do in general is just use phase estimation. But we talked about this uh, quite a bit in the uh, previous days. Phase estimation, unfortunately, uh, will only approximate your energy and will have some uncertainty. And that causes troubles because you don't know, uh, you, you cannot exactly compute the acceptance and reject probabilities because you only have an approximation <coughs> to your energy. And another problem which is uh, similarly difficult or maybe even more difficult, is that in the classical case, it was very easy to revert a move. We just recorded where you were before the jump, you did the jump, computed, compared the uh, likely the energies, and then if you decided to go back, just go back and forget the last step. <coughs> but in the quantum case, you can't quite do that because, um, because of no cloning. So it would mean in the quantum case that you copy your state and do a jump and, and keep either of the copies. Now this is, of, of course, impossible in general because no, no, no cloning. <coughs> and there is a solution to this uh, in some sense uh, using something called the marriott watrous rewinding technique. But that's also, that also has some difficult interplay with the uncertainty in phase estimation and it's kind of messy and hard to prove that it works right. So it's very difficult to analyze and, and not, not so nice to work with. But, well, this was the best uh, technique at the time, so that, that's how they described it. Uh, and this was the original approach. Uh, and so much of these uh, attempts at Gibbs sampling uh, try to deal with these two problems, this uh, rebinding problem and, and, the, and its interplay and, 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 uh, and also the fundamental difficulties coming from the ambiguity of the energy estimation algorithm. <coughs> so in the original uh, approach, they used a, a certain version of, of phase estimation which was shift invariant and boosted, but yeah, boosting is a, is, a, is a difficult property and this shift invariance which kind of meant that if you are starting an initial estimate, it just shifts your estimate by the energy that you have. That actually turned out to be not play well with boosting and there seems to be some technical issue with, with how that works. So the particular technical tool that they relied on in some part of the algorithm seems to be impossible to implement due to some topological reasons now, it, it has yet to be seen if, if, if some easy fix is there, but uh, the current version seems to have issues by this phase estimation uncertainty. And then they, there was a version of, of this metropolis algorithm which 
uh, being a, a quantum walk, try to apply uh, a random walk, try to use quantum walk techniques to speed it up, and they just assume that phase estimation is perfect, it gives you the energy exactly. Well, this is unphysical uh, because of this uh, um, energy time uncertainty principle. If you have some quantum system that you uh, interact with for time t, then basically the best precision that you can get is something like 1 over t in your energy estimates. This is the same thing as we have seen in phase estimation. So learning the, the energies is, is simply unphysical. And then rec recently, uh, Bokian and Tama uh, showed an alternative approach, which is very nice, and uses this quanti uh, continuous time quantum metropolis algorithm, which in the physics language corresponds to so-called Davis generators. But once again, they got into trouble with this uh, uncertainty about the energies, and <coughs> to solve it, they assume that the spectrum has some periodic gaps according to the <coughs> phase estimation mesh that they use. They call this a rounding promise, but this is once again unphysical. If you have some many-body system, then it often has continuous spectrum and will not have such gaps. <coughs> and very recently, there was a, a further improvement when they uh, could uh, resolve some of these problems in this continuous time setting by somehow randomly shifting their mesh of phase estimation and, uh, and, with, uh, and show that, that their mesh with high probability doesn't align badly with, with what you want to estimate and, and using these uh, kind of arguments they could, they could improve on this rounding promise problem. And <coughs> so now in this paper with my uh, co-authors, Anthony Chen, uh, Michael Kasvin, and Fernando Brandao, uh, we, we made one more step from this continuous framework and, and basically solved these issues. And the solution to this was first uh, using this very nice Gaussian smoothed version of phase estimation that I talked about, which gives uh, very nice properties of your estimators of the, of the energies. And the other ingredient was to use the operator Fourier transform, this uh, Heisenberg picture of phase estimation. And so these two new ingredients seem to tackle all the technical issues that uh, we have a long, has lo long history of struggling with. It was, it's really a challenging uh, combination of difficulties. So what's Fourier transform? Wha what is operator Fourier transform? And uh, well, why do we need that? Uh, Okay, I hope that you will bear with me. Uh, so now I describe you the continuous time quantum uh, processes and their metropolis version. And for this, I need a, a, a quantum analog of these infinitesimal jump operators that were the Laplace operators and, and how we get to the uh, Markov chain by that exponentiating that. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Gibbs state is a quantum state, which is a, it's a, it's a mixed state, it's not a pure state, but it's a perfectly valid quantum state, and uh, you wish to prepare this, this uh, mixed state in general, so that may be once you have the Gibbs state, you can measure observables and learn properties of this Gibbs state, which tells you, uh, if you have some, some system that you want to understand better, it tells you the behavior of your physical system at different temperatures and so on. Uh, so the Gibbs sampling is just preparing this state so that you can study and understand the properties of your physical system. That's like one of the main motivations. And this could be helpful for studying, uh, for example, I don't know, high temperature superconductors for which the theory is not very well understood. Uh, and if you have a tool of simulating things and understanding how they behave at different temperatures, that might just help you gaining more intuition and, 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 and understanding stuff. But also other uh, condensed matter systems and material science, understanding uh, different temperature uh, properties of your material are very important. And for that, it's, it's a fundamental primitive just to start and prepare the state which represents your physical system to begin with. Okay. 
well, uh, I don't know. Like a quantum state is is an ensemble of of pure states, and you want to prepare this ensemble properly so that the measurement statistics recover the Gibbs state statistics. So, so it, you well, one way of doing it, you could maybe prepare a purification of your state and then say that okay, if I trace out the second register, then the first register density operator describes the Gibbs state, and then you can do whatever with it. We have such purified algorithms, but also ones where you you are uh, simulating Gibbs state in the, in this ensemble sense. Well, yeah, so if you would have really good phase estimation and you could very precisely nail down the energies, then what you do is just you have your state, you apply some like local operation, it will su suppose that you are at an energy eigenstate. You apply some local operation, it will in general bring you to a superposition of other energy eigenstates. But now you can do again phase estimation and it will basically tell you in which energy state you got. And so it's a it's a random walk on, on energy eigenstates that way, but you know, to which exact energy you end up after doing it, I don't know, a million times these steps, that will be very closely approximating the statistics of the true Gibbs state. And so in a statistical sense, you are actually preparing the Gibbs state, although in every instance, you would seemingly just get a pure state for a particular energy. But the statistics of these, of these pure states that you end up with actually correspond to the Gibbs distribution. That's totally fine. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to see in this uh, discrete picture, but let me explain the continuous one, and then lots of these issues are actually resolved. Okay, so, yeah, um, but also maybe we can take it offline if more, more detailed questions later. <laughs> okay, so what was in the classical case, you had some infinitesimal jumps from one state to another one, and the collection of these were put in a Laplace uh, matrix, a Laplacian, and you exponentiated that. So we need something like that, but in a quantum setting. So there, the distribution is replaced by density matrix rho, and you want to do some kind of jumps. And it turns out that the jumps can be described this way, that you have your rho, and you are sandwiching it with some operators, k, j, and their dagger. And so this would mean that you transition from your current state to a new one, and these kg operators are the infinitesimal jump rates, but now they are matrices because we work with quantum systems. And then to make uh, everything trace preserving so that your quantum state uh, doesn't like uh, disappear, you also need to add this term, which is corresponding to decay. That's, that's how much you are jumping away from. That's the decay term. This is corresponding to the diagonal part of your Laplacian matrix. And so this is completely analogous, but now you have slightly more uh, difficult formalism to write it down. But just think about this as jump rates, transition rates, and decay rates. And so mathematically, this is the description of this continuous time quantum channels. And, <coughs> and if you want to know that if you are doing this uh, stochastic quantum random process for time t, then, then what is the quantum channel corresponding to time t evolution? And it's once again just exponentiate this operator, <coughs> which is now super operator because it maps density operators to density operators, and you exponentiate the super operator that's an even larger matrix. And it's a new super operator that describes your quantum channel. Okay, so this is completely analogous to the classical case, but the dimension is much higher. And <coughs> so now 
here comes how you would get the Metropolis modification of the jumps. And this is uh, something which is called Davis generator, and it's also uh, very similar to what happens in nature when you have thermalization. So you put your quantum system weakly interacting with a big path, and you wait, and then basically uh, what nature does and how it will uh, drive your system to this thermal state, which is the Gibbs state, it will be very similar to the Metropolis algorithm, just in a quantum setting. It's basically the same thing. Maybe some, some weight choice is slightly different, but essentially the same thing happens. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the Metropolis algorithm, if we change our energy, then we want to accept changes that decrease the energy and only accept uh, increasing energy changes with exponentially small probability. This is the Metropolis rule. So what should we do? So this K was uh, this jump operator, this transition operator, and we need to decompose it according to parts. Each part, uh, so I, I, I denote this delta part of this uh, operator K as the part of the matrix that changes energy by delta. So if you apply this part of your matrix to the state, then it means that it, it increased your energy by delta. And, uh, well, any transition in your, in your matrix uh, does some energy change. So if you are summing up over all the energy changes, then you recover the original matrix. Uh, so I for, for, for understanding this, just imagine that your matrix K is written in the eigenbasis of your Hamiltonian, then it really just corresponds to particular matrix elements in this table. And you are just uh, uh, decomposing it according to like how big energy change it induces that particular matrix element. Okay, so now your jump operators are decomposed according to how big energy change they do. And well, once you know how big is the energy change, you can apply the Metropolis step. If the energy change is negative, then you accept it. So this is the one here. And otherwise, if the energy actually went up, then you are accept accepting it with only exponentially small probability in the energy increase. And so this means that uh, your infinite infinitesimal jumps are reduced uh, in the case when it increases the energy. And there's also some decay part that is just the same thing as before. It's just uh, the, the thing that ensures uh, trace preserving mass. Okay, so, and, and here comes uh, the need for operator free transform. So once again, the energy differences uh, are called Bohr frequencies in physics. And as I told you, we can decompose any matrix K according to the set of Bohr frequencies. So K delta was the part that the transitions that, that changed energy by delta and then well, any transition does some energy, ener energy change, and any energy change can only come from two valid differences of energies from your Hamiltonian. So if you're summing up, then you recover the original matrix. And so what we wanted to do is somehow label different parts of your transition matrix with the different transition energies, the dif different uh, energy differences that it induces. So ideally, we, m we would have some qubits initiated, uh, initialized in zero state because that's what we usually do. And we have your uh, operator, and we wanted to label the operator with the corresponding energy change. And this is what we wanted to do. Uh, and if we, if we could do this exactly, then, then Metropolis something would work exactly, and everything would be very nice. Now, unfortunately, as I told you, because of this energy time uncertainty, you cannot do this, but you can do something approximately similar, and this is what we will do. And yeah, so, but now, once more, uh, in the perfect case, if you could perfectly label the energy difference in your jump, then once you have this representation, this decomposition of your operator, you could just further reduce the parts of this matrix where the energy went up by the metropolis weights. So if you would have this perfect energy estimation, you could do this perfectly and exactly get the right jump operators. And while after doing this, you would just get this Metropolis-modified 
jump operators which give you the new Laplacian, uh, sorry, uh, the Lindbladian, and that is how the uh, quantum analog of the Laplacian matrix is called uh, for these systems. Okay, and now, after this, uh, we came to the Fourier operator Fourier transform and what it is. So once again, what is the aim is to have a method to decompose an operator according to the energy uh, different transitions that it makes. Uh, and once again, just as in phase estimation, we will only be able to do it approximately because of the uncertainty and the energies that we can, how, how we can learn them. And uh, so this is the circuit. <coughs> I'm telling you that if you are running this circuit, then this will turn your matrix K to roughly uh, a decomposition where these omega bars, these would be good approximations of your, of your uh, Bohr frequencies, your energy change. And then when you measure here in this qubit some particular uh, omega value, then it, you, you can know that roughly the energy was changed by omega, by this operator, because of this decomposition. So this is the goal, and so I would like to explain why this holds approximately. Uh, yeah, and this is the story of, of this, uh, how to understand operator Fourier transform. So at the beginning, uh, we had this zero state, and we prepare some amplitudes. Uh, now think about preparing these Gaussian amplitudes, for example, that's very nice, as we talked about. So you have some amplitudes in this register, and you just have your matrix, okay? Uh, and so what happens here that controlled on this uh, regis T register here, you apply a Hamiltonian stimulation with time e to the minus i t, where the time is controlled by the register value here. Then you apply your matrix on the system of interest, and then you once again do Hamiltonian stimulation, but now with opposite sign of time, then you apply e to the iht. Uh, and finally, you will do a Fourier transform on the time register. So this is how it goes. And so let's understand what's happening. So when you apply this uh, Hamiltonian time evolution before and after k, and I am sorry, this uh, sorry, this tensor product is at the wrong place. It should be after the t. I didn't notice this typo. So you have e to the i h t k e to the minus i h t, and this with various t's here. Uh, yes, and so let's understand what is the effect of this time evolution backwards and forward, uh, and, and sandwiching k with it. So I am telling you that if you decompose your uh, operator by the Bohr frequencies, then it is just a, a simple phase that it's added here. And to see this, uh, notice that suppose that, that your operator is just a, is a rank one matrix, which is transitioning from eigenstate psi to psi prime. Now, when you apply this uh, Hamiltonian uh, evolution with minus time, then it will pick up uh, this energy of psi, but with a minus sign. And after the transition, you are uh, doing a uh, one second Hamiltonian evolution, but now uh, the eigenvalue, the energy of psi, psi prime will matter. And because you do this uh, time sign differently, what it will turn out that you can just pull these phases through and the difference of the energies will come into the picture. So uh, because it was, it was a, energy eigenstate psi, we know that it is just a phase added in, in this side, also just a phase added by this other operator, and the two phases we can just pull them together, and we get the difference of the energies induced by this rank one transition. And when we decompose the operator k according to these Bohr frequencies, then the same thing happens, that we basically just decompose our matrix to such rank one transitions or, or some linear combination of them, but the main thing is that uh, the part of the transition matrix which, which induces energy change delta, that will pick up a phase factor e to the i delta t, which is now scalar. 
So this is what's happening when you do this uh, time evolution before and after your operator. And now I'm just rewriting this summation. I just exchange the sums and regroup terms. Nothing changes when I move to this part. I just move the summation over the Bohr frequencies to the beginning, summation over t after, and I can see that there is uh, all, all, all the t dependence is now transferred into this uh, time register. And so here I have the original amplitudes f of t and multiplied by some phase which depends on the Bohr frequency that you have. But we have seen that uh, uh, a phase multiplication in the Fourier picture that is just shift. So after you apply the quantum Fourier transform, then what you will end up is that you will get a shifted version of the amplitudes uh, of the Fourier transform of f for the particular data that you have. And if we use this nice Gaussian weights, then it means that this, uh, after Fourier transformation, we will get a, a function which is peaked at the right value. Delta is the energy transition that we wanted to estimate. And these amplitudes will peak around that, so we'll, we will see an omega value which is very close to the actual energy uh, difference that we wanted to estimate. Uh, and then the corresponding uh, transition is indeed applied. So now I can only say that this is peaked, so if I regroup my, uh, my entire expression by the uh, energy difference labels omegas, then I get something k omega, and this is the operator Fourier transform of k. So formally, when I move from the operator k to this omega tensor k omega, this k omega, this, this I can think about this as a function of omega, that's my operator Fourier transform. And if I choose my uh, Gaussian weights right, then uh, intuitively speaking, this should be roughly, this k omega should be roughly, roughly uh, representing the part of the matrix when an omega uh, energy difference is induced after doing this operation. So this is the role of the operator free transform, that you decompose your uh, operator approximately labeling how big energy change it induces. Uh, and so what's good thing here, that we work with the operators. So we never encountered any problems related to no cloning because we just transformed the operators and labeled the jumps there. We never changed the, the state actually. So there is no issue with no cloning. We just analyzed and Fourier transformed our operator and that's perfectly fine. Nothing is violating the no cloning there. And, and this is why uh, this continuous picture is much nicer because here we just infinitesimal, we just modify the infinitesimal jumps and then that induces the right dynamics. And there is no cloning at all. Okay. Uh, any questions here? Because I think it's a difficult concept. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now the question is, okay, I, I can decompose my operators like that, but what is it useful for? So for this, we need to understand uh, how to represent such a infinitesimal jump operators, this Lindbladian, and how to make use of it in a quantum computer. So, uh, as I told you, in the Metropolis algorithm, we begin with some nice exploratory uh, process, which is symmetric. Uh, for example, kj, the j jade jump op operator, could be just uh, take the jade qubit and flip it with an x operator, something like that. And in general, the only thing that we need is that we need some uh, dilation of these jump operators. So this is some unitary matrix, which is a quantum circuit, such that uh, it labels the different jump operators with the corresponding labels, J. And this is just the input. Think about uh, KJ being just uh, XJ flipping the J bit. And so after 
applying this operator free transform on all of the operators xj, uh, or kj in this case, uh, we further decompose these kj operators and label them with approximate uh, energy uh, change labels, omegas. So we, we will have now one more label, j and omega, and then corresponding operator kj omega. So we had some maybe number of qubits, many uh, jump operators, and now we have many, many jump operators that also correspond to the energy difference estimates that we have. But that's still a Lindladian, and just having much more operators. Okay, so suppose that someone gives this dilation of now this modified uh, thing, this modified jumps. Well, I can just look at this uh, label omega and say, okay, well, let's assume that this is indeed how much energy changed, and let's reduce the transition matrices uh, slightly, which increase the energy by the metropolis weights. And then I get uh, a nice approximate representation of all the jump operators for the metropolis modified quantum process. And, okay, how to use that? And I am saying that actually this quantum circuit will approximate very well a tiny dat delta time step of your Lindblad evolution of this quantum stochastic process. So what does it do? Um, I try to explain this on in an intuitive level. So while there are some ancilla qubits which are just uh, storing uh, your labels, but what happens is that you have your quantum state of interest. This, is, this can be in general a mixed state row. And then you apply this dilation operator of, of all the jumps. And then you will see some jump labels and so on. Uh, and well, in particular, uh, when, when all these qubits end up zero after u, that means that you successfully applied some valid jump operator. If they are non-zero, then it means that, okay, this is, uh, this is something which we don't intended. It is just some uh, garbage in the encoding. We don't care. So you apply, you have rho, you apply u, and it means that in superposition, you applied a lot of jump operators, uh, and maybe you didn't succeed, and then you didn't do anything interesting. Now, suppose that you applied your jump operators, that is uh, signaled by these qubits being all zero, then we want to only weakly measure it. So it's kind of like only accepting these jumps with a tiny probability. And that means that uh, we model measuring these uh, jumps by inducing a slight rotation on this ancilla qubit. And if, if we rotate it to the state one, which, only, which we'd only do with square root delta amplitude, so delta probability, then it means that, okay, now we actually wanted to do a tiny jump, but only this like delta strong jump. And well, if, if that happens, then this qubit is set to one, and we say, okay, well, we did a small jump, good job. Otherwise, well, we actually don't want to do this jump, then we are running this circuit in backwards. So it means, that we reverse the effect of the, of the operation to begin with, and we erase all the garbage and other stuff that we did wrong. And <coughs> so the claim is that this will be a delta approximation of your Lindblad evolution. And so this is another application of the quantum Zeno effect. So uh, the nice thing is that <coughs> if you are only making these jumps delta strong in interaction, then it means that you can erase the rest of the operations, not perfectly, but much better than the progress that you made. It turns out that somehow the erasure of all these ancillas that you kind of put a lot of garbage into, that will be delta square precise. So you manage to do delta time evolution by only making delta square mass. And this is the usual thing how like trotterized evolution scale and all the first order method scale, uh, they ensure that you can do some delta progress by only making delta square damage. And then you know your target goal, maybe you want to uh, simulate your system for time t, 
then you need to divide time t up to many, many slices and make sure that all the small mistakes that you make, which are quadratically smaller than the progress, don't add up too badly. And if you just do the mathematics, uh, well, it turns out that you end up with a, uh, evolution time. So you need to do something like t squared over epsilon slices, where t is the evolution time you want and epsilon is the precision. Now this is not the optimal thing because uh, the complexity then scales quadratically with time, but actually because in all of these uh, individual jumps you only do something interesting with a tiny probability, in a way you can compress together many of these steps and just do them in one go. Uh, and doing this trick, which is uh, in use these more complicated circuits, actually uh, solve this Lindblad simulation problem in with linear dependence in time and logarithmic in precision. So much nicer than what is here, but requires more complicated circuits. But also this more general argument is kind of based on such a building block. And this was uh, originally showed how to achieve this nice linear dependence uh, on time by Cleve and Wang, I think in 2016, in their Lindbladian uh, evolution simulation paper. Uh, yeah, and I realized that, yeah, this circuit is kind of complicated. I think it's enough if you understand this on the high level, but in case someone wants to understand the details of, of why this uh, delta versus delta square issue comes in and how the quantum Zeno effect can be utilized. I actually put up a proof here, and so if someone wants to uh, check it, it will be on my website after the talk. But this is, you know, only for those who are really interested in the topic. The, the, the key thing is that here is a delta, and here is a delta square, and we are happy about that. <laughs> uh, Okay, so now we have described a way of doing uh, a metropolis version of, uh, of your Markov chains, and that actually closely represents what nature does. And that's really exciting because um, nature typically quickly thermalizes. If you leave your water bottle on the sun, it will pretty quickly get hot. And similarly, uh, a quantum system, if it's not too exotic, we hope that it will relatively quickly thermalize. And this metropolis algorithm that show I showed you is basically uh, very quickly resembles the best models that we have on thermalizations in nature. So in principle, if you have a quantum system which thermalizes quickly in nature, you just run a variant of this algorithm and that should also very quickly prepare the Gibbs state that you care about. Uh, and so I didn't talk about this, but, but this Gaussian damping still introduces some, some mistakes in energy estimation that still make some mistakes, but we were able to bound them. And basically we can show that if your system rapidly thermalizes, then you don't need too high precision to avoid all issues in this process and it, everything will approximately work through from the beginning to the end. Yes, um, well, but all of this is kind of dependent on, on this uh, process being uh, quickly thermalizing nature, which also means that uh, we would need to simulate this Lindbadian evolution for a relatively short time. And that's a major open question, how do you uh, bound this thing for systems of interest? Um, but we are hopeful about this, and uh, we can get some motivation from the classical side of things, where this metropolis sampling was uh, described and and uh, on a tier level described like many decades ago, and people started using it because it's very useful in, in computational solving computational problems. But only more recently, we were able to prove that it actually converges for particular systems whereas people have been using it in, in a high-performance computation for ages now, and we've only been uh, able to scratch the surface and, and show particular examples where we can prove that it converges and gives the right solution. So that seems to be an even more difficult problem than describing how to do it. But you know, in a classical case, it works really well, 
and converges in most cases, although we can only uh, prove it in a fraction of the cases when we apply it. But still, it's a very promising party heuristic algorithm. Uh, and an interesting feature of this is that we are basically simulating a thermodynamical system. And the thermodynamic system is thermalizing by basically doing random interactions, which is noise. So in a way, noise is what drives your quantum systems to the thermal states. So what happens if I try to do this algorithm on a noisy quantum computer? Well, it's kind of unclear, but there is some hope that maybe some version of it would be noise resilient because noise would be just an additional source of driving you to the Gibbs state. Well, that is the hope, but in this, in this uh, you know, maybe this algorithm, the way we implement them is actually quite flimi flimsy. So uh, there were earlier proposals about how to prepare Gibbs states, and that were like decades ago. And they had some ideas like, <coughs> okay, we know what happens in nature. I have a big system and a small system. I couple them, small system will thermalize. Okay, wonderful. Let's just build a huge quantum computer and simulate both the small system and the big system and then the small system will naturally be in the Gibbs state. Now, we all know that uh, getting a large number of good qubits is extremely difficult, <coughs> so this is not going to the way how people are going to simulate thermodynamics that they will simulate a huge system. But this formalism, this Lindladian uh, and, and, and quantum metropolis algorithm, is basically a way of simulating the effect of coupling to a huge bout without ever mentioning the bout. So in particular, it means that if you look at this circuit, then this, these are just some very small uh, number of qubits, somehow describing uh, the, the jump operators, that is some you know, number of uh, particles, so like number of qubits is logarithmic in, 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 the, in the system size or something like that, and, and something to record your energy differences, and that also doesn't need, need to be too precise, and once again, you are logarithmic in that. And they are like one or two qubits for implementation. So what it means in practice, that if you have a system of, I don't know, n qubits, then you need something like n plus 15 qubits in total to simulate the entire thing. And now that we have very, very few qubits available on a quantum computer, it's very nice that <coughs> you only need like 15 qubit overhead on top of the actual uh, interesting qubits that you care about. So for this reason, uh, I think that this is a very interesting algorithm, <coughs> and maybe uh, I, m maybe this is the most most uh, useful application that I showed you, and uh, maybe there is a hope to get a quadratic improvement in carbon capture and do something useful for humanity. I, I hope that <laughs> this is an appropriate end of this five-week journey, but I uh, fi five-day journey, and I hope that you enjoyed exploring quantum algorithms for Fourier transform. Thank you. Yes.